Hey guys, welcome to another Elvistory video. Um, so, this time I'm going to discuss the relationship between Elvis and Linda Thompson, who he dated from 1972 to about the end of 1976. And now, there are a lot of things to talk about with Elvis and Linda and some things I might mention might be a little graphic a little on the negative side and um, I just hope it doesn't uh, you know I'm not trying to put Elvis in like a negative light when I talk about these things and it's in no way uh, you know how I feel I'm just more or less telling Linda's story and um, obviously there was I mean there was many good times over the years between the two of them between uh, 72 and 76 but um, the thing with Linda's story it was uh, not that it was all bad by any means that you know they had a lot of good times together and you know like any other relationship it had its ups and downs but it wasn't a normal relationship by any means but there was no question that in my mind that they loved each other completely and both would do anything for either one so like I said um some things I mention might be a little graphic. Um, I apologize now if you know if it's hard for you to listen to, but the, the truth of it is, um, Linda was there at a time in Elvis's life where uh, things got progressively worse for him. That that was just really the truth of it. Uh, health-wise and addiction-wise because um, as much as we don't want to talk about it you know but we all do know Elvis had a problem with you know prescription drug addiction but what I love about Linda is the thing of it is um, she stood with Elvis as long as she could and tried to help him as much as she could you know over those uh, four and a half years and from what I know from what I've read um, you know she doesn't try to make a martyr out of herself you know um, she loved Elvis completely and there was nothing she wouldn't do for him but you know, things just got to a point, really, that um, where she really couldn't take it anymore. She was just drained, you know, emotionally, physically. Um, but it wasn't, like I said, talking about all these things I have in front of me, I don't want to put, I'm not trying to put Elvis into a negative light when I say these things. But it, it, it was just a reality. It was a re the reality of uh, how things went downhill for him, um, addiction-wise, in a matter of you know those five years between seventy-two and seventy-seven. I mean, I'm not saying all those years were um, negative and he was a manic depressant wasn't like that at all despite those struggles Elvis was still a very loving person um, him and Linda, like I said him and Linda had many many good times together and, and very special memories and uh, so much so that when they did call it quits um, Linda still kept in touch with Elvis she you know she called him a few times within a matter of months of them splitting up to check on him. Really, you know, just to make sure he was right because she knew uh, that he wasn't doing well. 
and um, she worried about him. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to start from scratch. I mean, this, this may be a long video. It may not be. I don't know. But I'm going to try to cover every detail as much as I can for you guys because um, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this story really broke my heart because I really felt Elvis and Linda had something nice together. And I thought Linda came into Elvis's life at a time after he lost his family, meaning Lisa and Priscilla, that he needed somebody there to, you know, help him rebuild his confidence, more or less, you know. He needed that support. And, you know, she was there for him in that way and in many ways and, and they just they really complemented each other um one way was you know they were both from the south they both you know really understood each other both being cut from the same cloth you know that really helped their relationship and so basically when linda was a little girl really she um she was, she was a big fan of Elvis's, and like every other little girl, she uh, would fantasize about marrying Elvis Presley. I mean, a lot of girls did back then, but, you know, she lived in Memphis. She was born 1950 and raised in Memphis by uh, her parents, Margie and Sanford Abel Thompson. And she also has a brother, some of you may know, Sam Thompson. And so, um, when she was a little girl, she spoke up one time, I think it was at the dinner table or something. She said, someday I'm going to marry Elvis Presley. And they were all like, you know, when anybody would say, you know, come on, Linda, you know, he's like so much older than you. And by the time you're ready for that, he won't be, you know, so, and she did actually, um, go to Graceland when she was a young girl. And uh, she got Uncle Vester to sign, I think it was a calendar, <clears throat> excuse me, that she, um, she had with her. And Uncle Vester brought it up to the house and had Elvis sign it. I mean, she wasn't sure if it was actually Elvis that signed it. She said either way it got signed, but, but she used to do that. She would hang out, you know, like every other fan by the gates and, you know, wait to see him or get an autograph or something. So, so Linda, um, she went to college at uh, Memphis State University and she won a few beauty pageants, to say the least. I think she actually won like all in all within um, four or five years time between, uh, I think, 68 and 72. I think she won like 12 beauty pageants and... Uh, one of them, I think, was Miss Shelby County in 1969 and Miss Mid-South in 1970. And she won Miss Tennessee Universe in 1972. And then she entered the Miss USA pageant in 1972. But she didn't win. I, I believe Miss Hawaii won in 1972. So, um... So she got back from that, and I think it was held in Puerto Rico or something. I think it was Puerto Rico. And uh, she gets back from that, and she's with um, a friend of hers that she made from uh, Rhode Island. Miss Rhode Island was Jeannie LeMay. And her and Jeannie shared the same room at the Miss USA pageant. So they became really good friends. And, um, so they go back to Memphis and they stay at, um, Linda's aunt's house at the time. And so one, one night they were out in Memphis and they go to a TGI Fridays and Linda wasn't going to go, but her friend Jeannie kind of pushed her into it. 
and uh, they meet up with uh, Linda's friend happened to be there a man named T.G. Shepard you guys may know him he's a country singer and he was also a good friend of Elvis's and so T.G. sees them there and uh, he goes up to Linda he's like hey Linda how you doing you know they start talking he's like you know listen um, Elvis is you know he's home and he's having a, a you know a gathering at at the Memphian theater tonight he's like would you guys like to go and meet Elvis so you know the girls are like of course yeah I mean you know who wouldn't want to meet Elvis back then you know or even now but <laughs> but anyway um, so they have lunch with TG and then they leave and they go back home you know to Linda's aunts and they get ready and, and later on that night they take uh, Linda she had I think she had like a Chevy Vega she said there was no air conditioning in it and you guys can imagine like in the hot south driving around in no air condition she, she was like it didn't matter because we were going to see Elvis so <laughs> so they wind up getting there and um, they let them in and uh, you know Linda and Jeannie are walking around and you know they're kind of all waiting for Elvis to show up and all of a sudden there's this um, this banging on the side door and uh, one of the guys opens the door because the door was locked and in comes Elvis like rapidly and he's like who locked the damn door he's like you know he's like I called somebody so and so and I told him to leave the door open and all the guys were like oh sorry boss sorry boss you know we thought you were coming in the other way he's like I called ahead and you know I told somebody to unlock this door he's like I won't ever happen this let this happen again so Linda was like he was really angry and then he was like looking around when he had this long flashlight and he's looking at everybody in the theater like you know did you lock the door did you lock the door and then he puts the light he happens to put it on Linda and his, all of a sudden his attitude changes completely to like complete southern gentleman and he's like oh well hello <laughs> I didn't you know where did you come from where have you been all my life so they they talk for a little bit they get to know each other and they joke around and Linda said right off the bat you know they had an instant connection you know she was just like very upfront with him like he was wearing like this uh, in the middle of the summer of July it was July 6th 72 the exact date of this he was wearing a black cape and like black pants and shirt and she's like who wears this in the middle of summer she told him and she's like he's like you know well he starts laughing and you know then they go inside to the theater and she notices he keeps looking back because Elvis sat like he had like a certain spot he sat in the theater and nobody sat in front of him so Linda and Jeannie uh, LeMay sat behind them so he um uh, she notices he keeps like looking back looking back at her and uh she says something to him like you know oh i love that gold watch you're wearing and he's like oh thank you like they were making like small talk back and forth trying to you know because uh they both really liked each other but the thing of it was linda's like i didn't know I thought he was still married at that point so I wasn't gonna make um, any kind of move or nothing and uh, all of a sudden before I know it he comes and sits next to me and so you know he starts putting his arm around Linda and she pulls back a little bit he's like I'm thinking he's a married man so I'm like oh, oh, you know so you know he he lets her know right right off the bat he's like He's like, well, it's not been in the uh, released into the public yet, but I am separated. I have been for a while. He's like, oh, I didn't know that, you know. See, your first mistake was you should have married a Southern girl. <laughs> so he's like, you know what? You're right. So they like really hit it off and talk back and forth. And 
they actually start kissing and she from according to Linda I think they were watching a double feature and neither one of them watched any of it so they they started kissing like for four hours he said like, and um, then it was time to leave and she gave him uh, her phone number on a matchbook now he, she was trying to play like hard to get and by that she meant like if he was going to come looking for her he was going to have to work for it so she um, she said I don't have any pen and paper you got to find a way to write my number down so he got a matchbook I think off of Joe Esposito and a pen off of somebody else and you know he she tells him the number and he has to write it on this matchbook and her friend Jeannie is like why didn't you just write it down for him what's the big deal <laughs> so she's like looking back now I'm like I don't even know why I did that but so they left and you know and Elvis was like you know I'll give you a call and you know maybe we'll get together so she's like okay and so now they go back to um, Linda's aunt's house and it's like 4.30 in the morning at this point. And so, you know, Linda's aunt was like, so how was he? Did you, know, did you get to meet him? Did you get to talk to him? You know, she's like, and then Jeannie is like, did she get to meet him? <laughs> she's like, you know, the two of them were inseparable. You know, they, you know, they were kissing all night. <laughs> so, so as they're talking about this, um, the phone rings and Jeannie's aunt, uh, Linda's aunt picks it up. And she's like, oh, hi, you know. So right away, Linda kind of knew who it was. And she's like, oh, yes, Elvis, she's right here. So nice talking to you, too, you know. So um, she said, he, you know, she gets on the phone with him. And, um, you know, he's talking to her. But she said, I noticed he was very, uh, his, his demeanor had changed in the way that he was slurring his words like and she's like and I you know I didn't drink I never did drugs I never I couldn't tell the difference if he was just tired or what but um, he's like you know I, I really want to see you again uh, please come up to Graceland tomorrow you know tomorrow night so she's like okay and sure enough um, later on that night because you know that was the same day 4 30 in the morning so later on that night at six o'clock at night she goes with Jeannie again Jeannie LeMay up to Graceland they get there at six o'clock and um she goes to the front door and uh Vernon opens the door and uh, he said, oh, Miss Tennessee, welcome. So nice to see you. So she said, you know, his dad was very nice. Like right off the bat, she said, Vernon was very nice to me. And uh, she said, we walk inside and Elvis is sitting in the, uh, what's now called the jungle room. And he's just sitting there very nervously, like, you know, shaking his leg. And then and she, he sees her and right away he pops up and, you know, they start talking and he, and then uh, it's like, oh, you know, let's go for a ride on the golf cart. So that's what they did. The first thing they got there, he brought them for a ride. And they were bopping all around Graceland with, in the golf cart. <laughs> Linda said he drove fast and all the bumps and he was laughing. And he said, we just had a lot of fun. And then he gave me, gave us uh, the tour of Graceland. And, and then uh, just him and her. Just him and Linda went up to the room at that point. And Jeannie was like, oh, Delvis, I don't think that's a good idea. You two being alone upstairs. You know, she was trying to be protective of her friend. And Linda's like, I'm a big girl. It's okay. And Elvis was like, you can trust me. I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> so sure enough, they have a nice little, they go upstairs and, you know, they sit in his room and they talk and, and they talk and kiss and kiss and talk. And she said before she knew it, it was, you know, like three in the morning. And um, she was actually going on vacation with her family to uh, 
the Gulf Shores of Alabama for like two weeks. And uh, she tells Elvis this. He's like, she, because um, Elvis wanted her to sleep over. He's like, you know, sleep over, sleep. Yeah. And she's like, no, I got to go with my family. And she's like, even if I wasn't going, I wasn't going to sleep over here the first night. She's like, that's way too soon for that. So he's like, oh, no, I understand. And I respect you for being that way. And um, so they part ways. And uh, so Linda goes to on vacation for two weeks. And uh, she said, now, mind you, where we were, there was no phones. You know, there was no way anybody could get in. Even if I wanted to call Elvis, I couldn't. And if he was trying to call me, he wouldn't been able to get in touch with me in any way. So, you know, they come back after two weeks. And uh, as soon as they get home, like maybe a couple hours later, the phone rings. And it's Joe Esposito. He's like, he's like, finally, he's like, we've been calling you like every day for the past couple of weeks. And Elvis wants, really wants to talk to you. And, and you know, so he's, he took, Elvis took the phone away from Joe. He's like, where the have you been? He's like, <laughs> you know, I've been trying to get in touch with you. He's like, when I say I want to see you, that means I want to see you. You know, how come? He, she was like, El she said, Elvis, I told you I was going on vacation for two weeks, but he didn't remember the two weeks part. So, you know, so they get past that. He tells her, Look, I'm in California. Um, I'm sending, you know, I want you to get on a plane. And at that time, he didn't have the Lisa Marie, so she flew commercially, first class, of course. He said, I want you to get on the plane, come out here, and I want you to go to Vegas with me. So she said, Elvis, I just got home. She's like, I don't, you know, I have nothing, you know, to bring with me. He's like, don't worry. Uh, you come here and, you know, somebody will take you shopping or you can, anything you'll need, you can have. So she's like, all right. So she gathered a few things. And so the next day she took the next flight out and she went to California to, to see him. I believe it was, uh, Palm Springs. So naturally, you know. She finally gets there and he's elated to see her and he's like, don't you ever disappear on me again. He's like, he's like, I want to be with you. He's like, I don't know how many times I got to tell you that I want to be with you. She's like, okay, you know, <laughs> so, um, so then a, uh, a couple of weeks go by and they're in Vegas and she says one day he just just out of the blue, they were, they were actually, it was the daytime, they were both actually tanning out by the pool in Vegas. And he just looked at her, and out of nowhere, he just said, I love you, I am so in love with you. And, you know, and of course, she's always been in love with him, <laughs> but since she was a little girl, but she said she actually, you know, after getting to know him for those couple of weeks, you know, they really fell, really fell head over heels for each other. And she really got to know Elvis the person and that's who she fell in love with. So it was easy, easy for her to say, I love you too. Because she really, you know, um, he really w was very sweet and nice to her like right off the bat and spoiled her and you know everything you can imagine and just like in a short period of time she they just really really fell in love with each other and then so Elvis does Aloha from Hawaii and for some of you guys that don't know her in case you're wondering um, Linda was there for that I believe she was in like maybe uh, probably the front row because I know Elvis uh, purchased tickets for uh, people around him and because it was a charity uh, event. So Elvis donated, I believe he bought like maybe a thousand dollars worth of tickets 
and but uh, Linda was definitely at Aloha from Hawaii and she recalls for before that um, when he knew he was going to do Aloha from Hawaii he uh, went on a very strict uh, 500 calorie diet and she said he was very uh, his eating habits at that point she said were very disciplined because he wanted to put on the best show he possibly could you know and he wanted to look the best because he knew how important this show was and he knew everybody around the world was going to watch it and so that's what he did for the show and he looked you guys remember he looked phenomenal and that's because he was uh like i said he was very uh very disciplined with his eating habits before that and then so now in 1973 um you now she basically gets to meet um Lisa Marie and um, she said uh, I never really got to see Priscilla much but in 1973 uh, Lisa Marie came to see Elvis and she finally got to meet her and Lisa Marie was like a little standoffish you know but then she got closer and closer and she's like you know, Elvis and uh, Linda would watch Lisa, and she finally came around and came up to Linda. She said, "You're so beautiful. Can I brush your hair?" <laughs> and so they they bonded, and uh, Lisa and Linda from that point on got closer and closer. And so now um, later on in '73. Uh, Linda started noticing basically with Elvis that uh, he was getting like his habits with prescription drugs were getting a little uh, worrisome let's put it that way and so for instance one night um, they were sleeping and this is where um, Linda started to having to watch Elvis at night. This is, was the first time that something happened to where it would affect the way she slept with him at night to where she couldn't sleep because she was afraid for him. And so what happened was they were sleeping and she wakes up and she noticed Elvis Elvis isn't breathing right and so she shakes him she said honey wake up honey wake up she said y your breathing doesn't your breathing sounds shallow and so right away when he wakes up he said I can't breathe I can't catch my breath and so right away she calls Vernon and um, a couple of guys and they come in and they they uh they call an ambulance and they have um, Elvis rush to Baptist Memorial and uh, when he got there the official diagnosis was pneumonia now I don't know if it was a reaction from uh, misuse of his medications I don't know but the official official uh, report was pneumonia and, and that was like one of the first instances of them having to stay in the hospital and she said when we did every time he was in the hospital um, I would have a bed next to him and stay with him at night she said that didn't change I didn't leave and go home she said I stood with Elvis in the hospital make sure he was all right she said but that was good in a way because it, it, it enabled her to sleep at night knowing that he had nurses and doctors around so it eased the burden on her a little bit to where you know she can rest 
and um, so now um, actually I want to go back a little bit in uh, at Christmas of 1972 I, I jumped ahead a little bit there that was a little bit into 73 but at the end of 72 and Christmas I wanted to mention that because that was actually I think the nicest Christmas they had together um, in their relationship and uh, what I mean by that was Elvis not because of the gifts he gave her he got her a nice coat mink coat you know and he also gave her money in one pocket so she can go buy him a gift because I guess he didn't know if she had money or not um, and in the other pocket was a ring and she took it out she said oh Elvis it's beautiful and it turns out um, he said now you put that ring on any finger you want He's like, but when it comes time for us to get engaged, you know, I want to see it on your ring finger. So it was basically, that was a uh, pre-engagement ring, you could say. So I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because my apologies, I skipped past Christmas of 72. And so now... Moving ahead to uh, Christmas of 73, um, Linda wanted to do something really nice for Elvis. So she went to, uh, she had this idea in mind of, get, of getting a cross made for Elvis. Um, it was like a pennant or something like that. Um, so she went to Lowell Hayes, Elvis's jeweler, and um, so she told him her idea. Uh, she wanted to have uh, a Maltese, Maltese cross made, and <clears throat> she wanted it covered in uh, pave diamonds, and she wanted the center of it to be. Uh, a gold eternity band with two sideways hearts representing her and Elvis one heart made of emerald being her brow stone and the other heart made of garnet which was Elvis's brow stone and so Lil he's like all right I'll come up with a price for you and he said I could do it for you for eight thousand dollars so Linda's like oh boy <laughs> so so she goes back to Elvis and she's like, um, I want to get a gift for you. Um, and it costs, he's, he's like, you don't have to get me a gift. He's like, I got everything I need, you know, you know, and the best thing being you and my family. He's like, I don't need gifts. Anything I want, I can go out and get. He's like, I don't need gifts. She's like, yeah, well this means something to me and I want to have it done for you. He well, said, okay, how much is it going to cost? So she said, $25,000. And he was like, what? He's like, what the heck are you spend $25,000? So, so she said, well, actually it's $8,000. How does that sound? So he laughed. He's like, oh, that was pretty good. That was pretty smart. So, so he went ahead and gave her the money and came Christmas of 73. Uh, he opened it up and she said he just sat there and stared at it and he, you know, he cried a bit. He said, this is the most, might be the most beautiful thing um, anybody has ever gotten me as a gift. Now Linda said, I don't know if that's true or not, but he was very appreciative of it. And, um, you know, he just sat there and stared at it for the longest time and he really, really loved it. And I believe... Um, she said it's still on display at Graceland. I don't know if it, um, if it's in the museum at this point. I don't know. Now, if you got any of you guys go there, you can look around. Um, but she did say it's there. So I don't know if it's actually in the mansion on display or if it's in the museum. So 
either way it's got to be somewhere <laughs> so anyway jumping ahead to 74 now um, this is a long one guys I'm so sorry I mean there's just so much of a story here that it's uh, you know it, I might even be missing things I might be jumping around a little bit you got to forgive me um, so basically in 1974 now when Elvis and Linda met, they were together like every day straight for like, I think it was like a year and a half from like July to 72 to 74. They were like together all the time on the road, Vegas, everything. And so she said for the first time in like a year and a half, he decides to start taking little trips to California without her and she's like that's kind of when I suspected you know well she began to suspect like he was starting to be unfaithful and so she said she you know she knew was some something was going on because you know Elvis was Elvis but she said it hurt her deeply but at the time you know, she accepted it and she understood the fact of, you know, him being Elvis and his needs and everything and how he was. And she said, you know, it's not like, um, she said, he still treated me like basically the queen of the castle, you know, but, um, so she kind of let things go for a while at the start. Um, not that she let it go forever, but just at that point, she was just like, all right, well, you know, it is what it is type of thing. So, um, so at that point, now in March of 74 is when uh, Elvis decides he wants to redecorate the inside of Graceland. And now he gave all these ideas. See, I originally thought he told Linda to pick everything out and he would okay it. But that wasn't the truth. The truth of it was he's the one that picked out all that red furniture, if you guys seen it. I mean, I put up a short video of it a while ago. It showed like the inside of Graceland uh, with all the red stuff in there. That was all Elvis. She said... To be honest with you, I thought it was a little over the top. I thought it looked like a bordello. And she said, the way it, the way Graceland is now is the way she actually prefers it to her taste. That's more close to her taste. But she said, you know, at that time, that's what Elvis wanted. She said, even though I like it the way it is today, she said, my opinion is they should have left it the way Elvis had it. Because that was his wish at the time to have it that way. So that was her opinion on that. But in any event, Linda begins to redesign Graceland. And she had the help of an interior decorator. And uh, so what they did in the basement, she said, now, when you go down to the TV room, um, she designed that uh, the cloud with the TCB. She designed that. And she also, her idea was to put the mirrors on the uh, ceiling to make it look higher and, you know, more open. So, then in the, uh, in the pool room, you know, they picked, they wanted to have like a tent-like feel. I don't know if that was her idea or Elvis's, but they had the, uh, if you ever been in the pool room in Graceland, it looks like an actual tent. They had like, uh, it's almost like curtains, I think, on the ceiling type of thing. And uh, so they did that in the basement. And uh, also they had, they had the three TVs set up. She said, because at the time, um, well, Elvis liked to watch, you know, all stations at once. And at that time, there was uh, 
only three main channels. It wasn't like it is now. There was only ABC, CBS, NBC. So that's why there was three TVs there. And uh, also, you know, if you go into Graceland, you're looking um, to the right in the living room area when you first come in <clears throat> those glass peacocks the stained glass Linda designed those peacocks she had that design too so that was her also and now when you look above the front door when you first walk into Graceland there's the pea stained glass with the roses Lynn, that was Linda's idea too she designed that also so um, a lot of the way Graceland is now today is basically because of the way Linda designed it. I mean, a lot of things Elvis wanted, like main things, like the jungle room. He wanted the green carpet on the wall. That was all his idea. But she helped, like, put, like, finishing touches on a lot of things. Basically, all the stuff, things you see there today were more or less uh, Linda's design. And uh, those ceramic monkeys, if you ever see them in the basement, like in the TV room, Linda went and picked those out. She had them put there. And uh, she also did some stuff in like meditation garden. She put uh, different like types of plants around and stuff like that. And it's, she had like a funny story. She said one time she was actually in the front of Graceland planting. Uh, putting plants in the ground and a tour uh, there's a group of tourists out by the front gate and they were taking pictures and she could hear them say oh it's a that's a female is, is that Elvis's gardener is she does she work here <laughs> but she didn't turn around or anything but she heard them say it so she thought that was kind of you know kind of funny and so now uh, later on in 74 uh, I believe her and Elvis were um, in Vegas, and they were they were uh, eating dinner. And now this is one time where Linda knew something was going on. She had seen it, like right. I think it was right in the paper. There was a picture of it or something. And Elvis, I'm not going to mention the person's name that he was with, because you know. But she knew exactly what was going on behind her back what he was doing so you know now you gotta remember what I said she was putting up with it in the beginning now it's like starting to hurt her more and more to see these things and so they're eating dinner together and um, she starts insinuating different things and uh, finally Elvis just snaps and he takes, he picks up his bowl, they were eating spaghetti, he picks up his bowl of spaghetti and slams it against the wall and broke all over the place and he starts screaming at her like, he, he's like, you don't know what it's like to be me. He's like, being around the same damn people all the time. He's, he's like, he's like, I need to be around different people. He, he's like, just because I'm with somebody else, you know, doesn't mean, you know, He's like, I love you, and, and he just, he was giving, like, every excuse in the book, you know, trying to, but she said he would, she never seen him so furious, like, he just blew up at her, and he was screaming at her, and, you know, backed her into a corner, and, you know, and so he went back to bed, and she just, she called one of the guys, she said, look, get me out of here. She said, I want to go back to, uh, um, I think it was Los Angeles or something at the time. So, so she left and then he called her the next day like, now they had nicknames for each other. Um, Elvis would call her Ari Adney Pennington and Linda would call him Baby Bunton, B-U-N-T-I-N. That were their baby names for each other like sometimes you know they would play the one of them would play the adult the other one would play the kid when the other one was sad the other one would play the adult and comfort you know that was their thing and those were their pet names for each other so elvis um 
say, oh, Ari, where did you go? How come you left me? I missed you. How come you weren't there when I woke up? Yeah, I love you. You know how much I love you. And, you know, she just basically uh, fell right back into it, you know. And she felt bad and she went back to him and, you know, they went back to uh, Memphis after Vegas and uh, she said one night he, you know, he came upstairs, she came, he came home and he's like, come outside, I got, I got to show you something, I got something for you. So they go outside and they, he got her um, this nice yellow 71 Ford Pantera. And she's like, oh my God, this is beautiful. Thank you so much. You didn't have to get me a car. I already have a car. She had a little Chevy Vega, but Elvis wanted to get her something nice. So he did. And the car was beautiful. And she said, he's like, well, let me drive it first. He's like, I don't know if I trust this car. Let me see if, if it's, if it's good, I'll let you drive it. So he did. He took it out for a spin with the guys, a couple of guys, and they came back and he's like, um, this car is too fast for you. You can't drive it. If you want to call it yours, you can call it yours, but I don't want you driving. It. It's too squirrely, he said. So she's like, all right. So one night they were going out. I think they were doing a late night run to the Memphis and, you know, going to the movies at night like Elvis liked to do. And uh, so they get in the car, the same car, the Pantera. And Elvis drives it because he don't want her driving it. And he goes to start up. She's like, the car just wouldn't start. And Elvis was using every curse in the book. I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> but I know what he said. But, you know, he's like, son of a, you blankety blank. And he was like, he couldn't get it to start. So he's like, Linda, step out of the car. She's like, why? He's like, please, just step out of the car. She's like, why, what? So this went on for like a few minutes. And finally, so she got out of the car. And she said, they both, then Elvis got out. And he whips out his gun. <laughs> he said, she, she goes, he fired five shots <laughs> into, <laughs> into the Pantera because it wouldn't start. So the guys come running out. They're like, what's going on? What's going on? And, and you know, Elvis is like, this piece of junk won't start. And so, you know. He's going on about it, and then finally, one of the guys get in, and uh, Elvis didn't ask him to, one of the guys just got in, and it started right up, and so they all just started laughing, like <laughs> crazy, it was just, she's like, that was one instance where, you know, his temper just was like, you know, and uh, she said another one being like that Robert Goulet on TV instance, where she said, she wanted to set the record straight. She said, Elvis didn't hate Robert Goulet. You know, that, that's the popular opinion. Everybody thinks he, because he was on TV, that Elvis just shot him. She said, it, he didn't, he actually liked him. He didn't hate him. He just hate, they were watching TV one night in the bedroom, in Elvis and Linda's room. And uh, Elvis had that TV in front of the bed, you guys know. And um, he said, Linda... Look at this guy. He's stiff as a board. He's not singing this song right. It's a beautiful song and he's screwing it up. And he's like, do me a favor. Please step outside, <laughs> outside the room. So Linda's like, Elvis, what are you going to do? He's like, don't even tell me you're going to shoot this TV. He sees it. I'll get up and I'll just change the channel. He's like, no, no, please just get up and leave the room. So after a few minutes, she got up and she left the room. She said, as soon as I shut the door, I hear boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Elvis is like, all right, come back. And so she goes back in and she said the TV is just, oh, you know, it was gone. It was <laughs> so Elvis said, well, go downstairs, tell him to get this piece of, you know what, out of my room and... Have, tell him to order me a new TV. So that's what she had to do. She called downstairs and one of the guys, she said, well, 
Elvis needs a new TV because <laughs> this one's dead now. <laughs> so, um, that was just uh, another instance of um, when Elvis used to just, you know, he he just want get in one of those moods and just shoot something, you know. So, that was one, I mean, it was funny, but, you know, in one sense, but in another sense, it was, you know, you think about it now, that was pretty dangerous. But he did always make sure that, like, Linda was either away from what he was doing or, you know, not around it. So, and also she was like, um, now this is how, she said, this is how nice Elvis was. And he said, uh, it's one time in 74, they, they all, uh, they went to this puppy store, this pet shop, and Elvis bought, I think, she, he, she said he, he cleaned them out of puppies, basically. And um, everybody got a puppy that day, and, you know, she came back, they came back to Graceland with all these puppies in the car, and I don't know if this was the time where I think Billy and Joe Smith were with them, but I said everybody, you know, the car was full of puppies, they were licking everybody, and, you know, she said, when we got back to Graceland, you know, we just gave puppies to everybody, <laughs> everybody got a puppy, Aunt Delta got a puppy, this one got a puppy, and, uh, he named, um, one of the puppies, <laughs> he named Fox Hugh. Now, the reason why he named the, the puppy Fox Hugh is because he wanted to mess with people. So if they mess up saying his name, it sounds similar to F you. <laughs> and that was a, you know, he named him that dog on purpose. And the story behind that was a director actually did that to Elvis on one of the movies. He named one of the characters Fox you, and Elvis kept messing up the character's name and saying that. So, you know, and uh, it turned out the director did that on purpose just to play a joke on Elvis. But that's why Elvis named the dog Fox Hugh, because he wanted to mess with people. And sure enough, I think it was Linda's uh, niece came over, and she was very young still, and she couldn't pronounce the name right, so she was saying the curse, you know? <laughs> so she said, every time she said it, Elvis would crack up laughing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, then in... Uh, Later on now, in 74, uh, she said, basically, Elvis had glaucoma. Now, uh, he didn't develop it in 74. I'm not saying that. But he had glaucoma now. He needed um, medical marijuana, I guess you could say, for the pressure on his eye. I don't know if it was medical marijuana at the time. I don't know if it was prescribed to him. I don't know where he got it. I don't know. But she said that for like three months, Elvis smoked marijuana. And the reason being, like I said, was for his glaucoma. And so um, he asked her to uh, try it. And she did, and she's never done anything in her life. Linda was like Miss Goody Two Shoes, and she called herself that. And so she tried it, and the first thing was she kind of freaked out. And she, and she said she had the worst panic attack of her life, and you know she was running out to the windows of Graceland, yelling out, "Side, you know." God, please, you know, I'll never do this again. And she just said that she didn't realize um, just how tightly wrapped she was from, you know, her concerns over Elvis, really. Uh, she was trying to be, she was consumed, basically, with uh, trying to take care of him and, you know, watch over him and uh, 
basically make sure that nothing would happen to him that you know she did she was losing herself she didn't realize how just how uh just tightly wrapped she was really and you know and uh so that's why she kind of had that reaction to the marijuana and so she said she knew from that happening at, that that was a sign to her that you know um things were getting tough for her mentally you know as far as uh she was always the thing was she said he would come and go as he pleases you know please and did what he want went out with the other women and all this other stuff but you know but being around him she had to walk on eggshells she couldn't say things the wrong way you know like you know oh that guy's nice looking or something he would flip his lip because he told her in the very beginning like i'm a very jealous person and so she would walk on eggshells with anything she said about anybody around him and not only that she would cater to his ego you know to where you more or less just dis didn't disagree with him if he was in one of those moods so she said all that was starting to get to her to where you know what you know what he did didn't matter but if anything she did wrong forget it you know he would go off on her you know what i mean so it was a combination of those things and being worried about him staying up late at night watching over him because she couldn't sleep since the first time that happened with his breathing ever since then she watched over him so and that was another thing she wanted kids with elvis but she said i just knew it wasn't the environment that that we could have children she said how was i going to tend to a child she said i was already tending to a child basically more or less she said yeah, i didn't sleep till I, I knew he was okay and he woke up and then i would rest a bit and she said how was i supposed to take care of a child if i wanted one? I wouldn't be available to the child you know so she said that plus you know his addictions were getting worse and worse so it, she just felt like it just even if you know we did get engaged or married she said to bring a child into that type of environment you know was not the right thing in her mind and i agree with her it really it really wasn't you know i love elvis too but at that point you know the lifestyle was just you know it, it was not i mean i don't want to sit here and say you know elvis would have been a bad father by no means it was just the fact that you know he would have he would have doted over another child you know he would have spoiled them but his habits would have hindered uh the child growing up correctly if you think about it you know she would have to watch over him like i said not get her rest and not be able to uh be alert to raise their child and she wouldn't want also a child to grow up with all this going on with elvis because he was at this point he was really starting i mean we're, we're heading into 75 now he's starting to really go uh get worse with his addiction you know and all these things um were really getting to her they were really really getting to her on top of that plus you know she said the affairs were starting to get more and more blatant like and she said at least in the beginning he would go off to california uh do his thing whoever he was with you know it just became it just became like you know she knew what was going on type of thing but they just kind of went through the motions anyway but she said after a while it just the hurt from that alone got deeper and deeper and deeper never mind me taking care of him she said that in itself was getting uh more and more hurtful so you know at this point she was kind of starting she said, I think it was towards the end of um, 
74, she was starting to uh, pull away from Elvis emotionally because she knew um, she knew this really wasn't the life she wanted to live. It wasn't anything against Elvis, the person. She said, I knew he loved me. She said he was the sweetest man I ever met. And there was no doubt in my mind we were in love, but this just wasn't the type of life that I wanted to live. You know, I didn't want to just sit there and watch the person I love just destroy himself. And, you know, she said he once told me that that's my biggest fault is that I'm self-destructive. And he was right. So, you know, all those things were going on in her mind and, you know, it was slowly becoming less and less of a relationship because like I said he was just you know the addiction was getting worse you know the fooling around was getting worse and it was getting so you know to where he wouldn't even hide it anymore it would just be like out in the open and she said it, it just you know she said why basically she was questioning it like why am I even here you know He's got all these other women, you know, you know, why am I even here if I, if I'm trying to build a life with somebody and they're off running around with somebody else, what is that, you know, how is that good for me, you know, and all these things were just building and building and like I said, so by the end of 74, emotionally Linda started pulling away from him, but you know, they went on obviously they went on dating because you guys know they, they dated till about I think the end of 76 so this is just starting to happen you know this is the pulling away is just starting to happen in uh, 74 beginning of 75 so and she said uh, so in 75 Elvis had uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard the rumors that Elvis had a facelift she said he didn't actually have a whole facelift done. She said that's partially true. He had like a, his face pulled back like a little bit. Like he had like incisions done behind his ears. But uh, she said the doctor didn't really want to do it because at the time he was only 40 years old. She, the doctor's like, he's still too young for this, but he wanted it done anyway because he kept looking in the mirror. And, um, uh, you know, he didn't like what he's seeing, and Elvis was very, you know, cognizant of his looks, you know. So he did have that done. And, uh, so Elvis, you know, basically, uh, that same year also, he has to get admitted to the hospital again. Because now she said at this point, uh, what was being put out in the news was, you know, basically, you know, one time it was, he was flu-like or he had, you know, it was always a different like type of thing or exhaustion. And she said, you know, basically the truth in the matter, it, it, nine out of the 10 times it was because of his addiction. And so, um, they put, he had to get admitted to the hospital again to uh, basically stabilize his, uh, his body, his system, and, and uh, stabilize his uh, prescription drug abuse. That, that was the other time that, you know, that was another time that he was in the hospital. It was, like I said, a lot of uh, times where all basically because of that it was really nothing else it wasn't because of the flu it wasn't because of this or that it's it centered around his drug abuse his prescription drug abuse you know I, I mean I know this is hard for you guys to hear but um, it's just it's just the truth of the matter you know but uh, she said that year also you know he started gaining a lot of weight too and then um, he went on this special diet in 75 in Vegas. Diet. And I'll explain to you 
what it means. He uh, saw this doctor in Vegas and um, what they did was they basically sedated Elvis. It was going to be, he, he went under sedation for two weeks. That's the best way I could put it. They sedated him to where he would only get up to have a little bit to eat and go to the bathroom. He was sedated for two weeks to lose weight. And now, according to Linda, in Elvis's mind, this was all, you know, normal to Elvis. To her, it was just, you know, she was like, in her mind, she's like, this is, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, to lose weight. You know, you could just go on a diet, exercise, but, you know, it's not something she was uh, on board with, let's put it that way. And um, so that's what went on. And she said, I stood with him while he was, because Elvis was staying at this doctor's house for two weeks under the sedation she said now I stood with Elvis the whole time even though he wasn't awake and she said it got to a point though close to the end of two weeks I had to get out I had to get out I couldn't take it no more so she went out to Vegas and she actually hung out with some of the guys some of the guys in the Memphis Mafia and stuff like that she said I just had to get away from it you know, she said, I didn't like what was going on here. I didn't like what was happening to him. And she said, I, you know, things were just getting to a boiling point with her. You know, she was exhausted physically, mentally, you know, emotionally. And so, I mean, she stuck with him the rest of the time he was there. But, you know, she didn't, you know, she just didn't like the whole idea I mean that that's just and you guys think about it too that's the, it's the craziest thing you want to lose weight you go on a diet you know go on a treadmill or something Elvis went under sedation for two weeks to lose weight I don't know who this doctor was but I don't see how that's a normal medical practice myself that's my opinion so anyway now, um, now she basically uh, runs into another instance of um, Elvis cheating on her. And what happened was one night, this was uh, I believe in 75, um, they were in the limo going out. And the driver, I guess the driver forgot who Elvis had in the limo, maybe not too long before that. He turns around and goes to Elvis, oh, uh, your girlfriend left us in the car the other night. You know, so I guess he thought it was Linda. It wasn't Linda. And so Elvis just like did one of these uh, um, type of things. And Linda took the ring from the driver. She said, oh, thank you. I was wondering where that was, but she was just playing along. And she's like looking at Elvis. She's like, hmm, you know, and she was like really kind of messing with him. And uh, she didn't like blow up at him or anything, but she said that was just one of the instances where it was becoming just so blatantly obvious that, you know, I mean, she's like, I knew I wasn't the only woman in his life. She, I knew he loved me, but I knew this was just getting worse and worse with the women. And that was one of those instances where he just got uh, caught red-handed, really, more or less. And um, now Linda always, like I just brought up the Memphis Mafia, she... She always, she said all the guys, she got along with all the guys, they were all, you know, they were all great to her and they really loved her. And, and 
one of the reasons was they used to joke with her and say, you know, you make our life so much easier <laughs> because it was the truth because she doted over Elvis. I mean, she, you know, she did all she could to make sure he was okay all the time. Every time they were together, like, especially at night when they were sleeping, you know, and, um, so now at this point, uh, at this point, Elvis's addiction is just like, really, you know, I know I keep bringing it up, but it's, it gets to a point where guys in the Memphis Mafia and Linda and Dr. Nick, Elvis's uh, physician, Dr. George Nicopolis, they start getting involved. Um, they knew he was 40 years old, 41. And they knew, you know, if he wanted to change, he had to do it. And they knew they couldn't take a 40-year-old man up and bring him, because, you know, he's a 40-year-old guy. If he's going to change his ways, he has to do it. So they did other things besides that. Like they would take uh, his prescription pills and they would empty them out or, or replace them with sugar or you know they would start doing things like that and uh, because there was just you know and at one point um, it was so bad that they were in Vegas um, towards the end of 75 I think and um Elvis and Linda were uh, eating dinner and Linda finished and Elvis was sitting up in bed and eating chicken noodle soup and um, Linda says, oh, honey, you okay? Did you take your sleeping pills and everything? So he's like, yeah, honey, I'm okay. I took, you know, I took my sleeping pills like she said now. I knew he took his sleeping pills, but she said, I don't know what else he took besides that. And she said, and why I say this is because I went, you know, I made sure he was okay. And then I went into the bathroom to get changed, you know, for bed, wash up and everything. And uh, I come back and Elvis's face face down in his bowl of soup, passed out. And so, so right away, um, she uh, jumps on top of him, lifts his head up, and you know, starts smacking him, wake up honey, wake up honey, wake up honey. And she uh, opens his mouth and she said, I literally had to start pulling food out of his mouth. And uh, she stuck his, her finger down his throat, took out whatever food was there, blocking his breathing because he wasn't breathing. And she pulled out food, as much food from his throat as she could to clear his airwaves. And then uh, she said, now there was a Ritalin needle next to his bed for an emergency just in case so she said i did i never like to give injections but she said i grabbed it and i just gave him the shot of ritalin and then right away i called the doctor in the hotel and i called one of the guys came also um i kept trying to wake elvis up and finally the doctor came in and um went up to Elvis and gave him a larger dose of Ritalin and he finally <laughs> snapped into it. Now, this is what I mean by I apologize by getting graphic. But this is what actually happened. This is one of the times, probably the second time that Linda saved his life. This is how serious 
this problem was with his drug addiction. This is how serious it was. You know, you know, I don't like telling the stories. I love Elvis. I don't like telling this, uh, but it's just the truth of it. This is what she went through. This is what the reality of it was with him at that time. But, you know, she said he just curled up into a ball like a little kid and started talking baby talk to her. Like, I had a dream that you were my brother and that I lived and you died and because of me. And she said, it, it, you know, she was just holding him and, you know, she just couldn't believe what she was hearing. She said that whole night was just the, like just such a crazy, crazy night. And then, um, now the rest of those shows in Vegas, naturally they had to cancel. And, um, Elvis had to fly back to Memphis. Now she says it was on a plane equipped with oxygen, just in case of anything for Elvis. They had to uh, bring him back to Memphis and, and admit him once again into Baptist Memorial Hospital uh, because of what was going on with him, with these prescription pills. Uh, now they said, Dr. Nick, um, now he gets a lot of flack, but According to what, from what I read with Linda, he was trying his best to steer Elvis away from so much. The thing of it was, Dr. Nick gets a lot of blame for overprescribing Elvis. The truth of the matter was, Dr. Nick would give him a certain amount and say, don't go over this, don't get it from anybody else. But if Elvis ran out and somebody told Elvis, no, Elvis was going to get it somewhere else. And that's the truth of the matter that was going on. You could watch any interview of any one of the guys in the Memphis Mafia. That's what was really going on with Elvis. Dr. Nick wasn't just giving him candy like a baby and over prescribing him, and, you know. Maybe he gave him a little too much sometimes. I'm not saying he was an angel. But when he saw Elvis was at a point where it was too much, Dr. Nick was trying to do his best to steer him away from that type, you know, to get his get him down to where he was only taking what he was supposed to be taking and not a lot more like he was. And the a lot more he was getting from other doctors that wouldn't say no to him. And that's the truth of what was going on. Like I said, I'm not saying Dr. Nick was an angel. Maybe he should have prescribed him sometimes, you know, not so much, but Dr. Nick did try to do his part in making Elvis, you know, not rely so much on heavy medication. So while they're in Baptist again for the same thing, again, uh, Elvis stays, uh, Linda stays with Elvis, same thing, they put the beds in the room, uh, she stays with him day and night, you know, and at this point it's just becoming such, uh, it was just becoming such a nightmare for everybody to watch him destroy himself like this. You know, especially, you know, everybody that he loved, that loved him. You know, that that's the thing with an addict. They don't realize what they're doing to the people around them. I've been around it. I lost my father personally to addiction. You don't realize uh, what it does to the people around you. Because when you're an addict, it's all about you and what you want when you're in that state, you know what I mean? So, you know, Dr. Nick, you know, he bring, he tried, like I said, he tries to help him. They, uh, try to get him, they give him, uh, 
I don't know, they bring him down somehow to where his, uh, they lean him off the heavier stuff he was on. And then not only that, uh, Dr. Nick had addiction specialists, Linda said, this is the truth. Dr. Nick had addiction specialists come into Baptist Memorial Hospital to try and help Elvis. You know, this, this is not, you know, one of the things that you, it's always the bad things about uh, Dr. Nick. You know, this was one of the things he did to try to help Elvis not be so, you know, reliant on the medication. You know, because a lot of times it, Dr. Nick told him, you don't need that much. You know, yeah, you need this for certain things, but you don't need that much. And Elvis just did, that's how Elvis did things. He did things in abundance. And his, his addiction was no different. But, you know, like I said, I'm not saying Dr. Nick was a, any kind of angel, but he did try to, you know, lean Elvis onto a, a not so heavy pill regimen. You know what I mean? And by bringing in the addiction specialists to help Elvis psychologically was a really good move on his part. I mean, nat naturally, now uh, they said for a while it worked in the hospital, you know, but then it was boom, right back to Vegas. And uh, they go back to Vegas in 75. And it was the same stuff all over again. Elvis was okay for a little bit. And one night, uh, he says to Linda, call up Red. I want to go to the dentist. The dentist. Really. She knew he was like, you know, full of it, basically. And so, Red comes in. I guess Sonny, Sonny was there too, actually. And, um, he starts telling Red, you know, what he wants to do. And Red knew what was going on. Red knew the score of the game. You know, he, he, he's like, I'm not doing that, Elvis. He's like, I'm not, I'm not taking you to get these drugs. And he's like, no way. So they started fighting, you know, yelling, with, not fist fighting, but just yelling at each other. He's like, you know, we're all tired of seeing you like this. This has got to stop. He's like, y y you're too much into these drugs. And, you know, Red really let him have it. And Elvis, Elvis wasn't having it because he was an addict and he wanted what he wanted. And so Linda got in the middle of it. And she was like, guys, just stop, just stop. And she said, she said, like, I knew full well that Red carried a gun. Elvis always carried guns. She, I wasn't thinking. She said, I just got in the middle because I wanted them to stop fighting. And so finally, you know, they backed away from each other. And, and Sonny pulled her aside, Sonny West, uh, Red's cousin. And he said to uh, Lindy, he said, don't ever do that again. Don't ever do that again. She said, but I was just, he said, yeah, they're not going to take out a gun and shoot you, but you never know. You never know with these guys. He said, don't ever get in the middle of them again. He said, there are guns there. Who knows what can happen? You know, I'm not saying Elvis would shoot you or Red would shoot you, but just don't ever do that again. And he was just, you know, trying to protect Linda. But that was just another instance of Elvis, you know, trying to get, uh, he, he was, he was losing his battle with his addiction. You know what I mean? At that point, he was just, it didn't matter how many times he went into the hospital. It didn't matter how many times he got weaned off of medications. It didn't matter how many times he stopped. He just kept going back. You know, I don't know what you know, I know he was a sick man. I know he had ailments. I know he had glaucoma. I know he had the spastic twisted colon. I know he had uh, several things wrong with him. But, you know, uh, but it just got to, it, it just got to be worse and worse and worse. And 
everybody, you know, everybody around him, you know, a lot of them say, oh, we didn't think he would die because he was Elvis, you know, but everybody's human. Elvis was no different. And, and his addiction struggle, uh, who knew if he would have ever beat it? Who knew? I mean, nobody knows if he would have. But at this point, Linda is just basically um, needing to have a different type of life. And so, more or less, she gets an apartment. Now, she tells Elvis, you know, I think I'm going to get an apartment in Los Angeles because she wanted to do some acting. And so she did. So Elvis was like, yeah, that's a great idea, you know. And so, you know, Elvis helped her out with a little bit, you know. He got her some furniture. And and so she said, at that point, I wanted to start creating a life for myself because I was preparing for my time after Elvis Presley. She said, I knew I wasn't going to stay with him. I knew I couldn't change him. He had to change for himself as far as the drugs went. As far as the fooling around went, she said, this wasn't the life I wanted for myself. And I felt I deserved better than that. You know, it's not that he purposely meant to hurt her. He loved her dearly. He did. But he was just, you know, he wanted what he wanted. Elvis saw something, he wanted it. You know, and not saying that he didn't have other people's feelings in mind, but you know, he was just so used to things being a certain way in his life that he didn't think twice to do it. You know what I mean? It's not like he didn't love Linda. He loved her incredibly. He really did. And, and they never stopped loving each other. That's the whole thing of it. You know? So, so now, in the fall of 76, uh, basically... In about November, I guess you could say about autumn, that autumn, around November, um, Linda finds out basically she knows Elvis is seeing uh, somebody else that lived in Memphis. And uh, somehow word got back to her. She said, sometimes. That's how I found out. Word just got back to me, you know. Sometimes I would find out on my own. Sometimes word got back to me. She's And uh, this time she found out Elvis was seeing uh, this other woman that lived in Memphis. And it turned out to be uh, Ginger Alden. Um, so now... They go to uh, San Francisco, Elvis and Linda, because Elvis is doing um, a couple of shows at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. And uh, this is November of 76. And um, so they, they, uh, they're in the room one day and Elvis tells Linda, look, I'm having the... Um, I'm having the uh, Lisa Marie come, the plane. At this time he had it because he got it the year before. And I'm going to, uh, I think you need to rest. I think you need to go back to Memphis and rest and see your parents. And he's like, I know you're really tired, you know. And so she's like, hmm, you had this, you sent the plane out to come here. Because you felt I was tired and you you want to see me go rest and see my parents. She said, and in her mind, she's like, yeah, I'm tired, all right. I'm tired, I'm tired of you lying to me. I'm tired of all the deceit. I'm tired of, you know, taking care of you while you, you just go out and have fun. And, you know, in, in her mind, this is what she's saying to herself. But she says to him, she said, okay, all right. And so the next day, she packs her stuff and gets ready to go back um, home.
home to Memphis. And she says, um, let me ask you something. Who is that plane really for? Look me in the eye, Elvis, and tell me you did not have another girl come here to be with you. You're going to stand here and tell me that, she said. And, and he said, oh my God, you really think this is another girl? You, you, oh my God. He's like, he's like, I love you. He's like, you're the only one I love, blah, blah, blah. And he pulls her closer and he's looking her in the eye. And he's, he's like, you're the only one I love, Ari. Ari, <laughs> you know, that nickname he used to call her. You're the only one I love. And, you know, now if you get back home and you hear things and you see things in, in the uh, papers or anything, just know that I love you, you know? So in, in a way, he's kind of almost admitting it. So she said, I knew at that point I was just done. She said, that was just, you know, that was it. She said, I, I knew that was the last time we would see each other. And so she, uh, and all the while, it was true. Ginger was waiting in the wings, the next floor below them, for Linda to leave so she can be with Elvis. And so, like I said, but that mind Linda left. She knew it. She knew it was over. And so she went back to Memphis and she, she decides to uh, pack up her things and start moving out. And that's what she did. And her dad helped her, I believe. And... Uh, she just remembered, you know, she just, she's like, I gathered all my stuff. You know, I just looked around thinking of all the good times we had. She said, despite, you know, despite the, you know, things going on with him, his addictions, the infidelities, she said, I really did love this man. And I know he really does love me. That they never stopped loving each other. You know, like I said before, Linda just felt like there was a better way of living she wanted for herself. And and I can't blame her. And so she said she looked around a little bit, you know. She grabbed his pillow. She said, this is something I had to do. She grabbed his pillow one last time and just put it on her face just to breathe in his scent one more time. And then she said, after that, you know, I looked around a little more and I left. And my dad helped me pack my stuff and leave. And she said her father, actually, after they left Graceland, she said, Linda, he said, Linda, are you okay? And she said, Dad, I'm fine. I'm great. Because she was happy. She, she was uh, hurt because she did not want it to end. She loved him. She loved him a lot. And Elvis loved her a lot. But Elvis was going to be Elvis and she knew that. So she had to, for her own sake, for her own pride, she had to move on with her life. But, um, so then she, uh, what she does is she goes home and she writes Elvis this two-page letter. And uh, she also buys him a ring for Christmas. This is after everything. Goes back to Graceland. And she said, she, I gave this ring and this letter to Billy Smith because I trusted him. She said to Billy, um, make sure he gets this. And so now... According to, I don't know, uh, I don't know when she spoke to Billy again, but I think it was maybe a month or so after she, he said, I did give it to him, the ring and the letter. 
And, um, and she also told Billy to tell him, no matter what, I will always love you. And I will always be here for you. If you need me, just call me. And so, uh, Billy's like, I gave him the ring and the letter and he just sat there quietly for a very long time. A very long time. He said, I know he was, he still loved you. And, you know, she said that, um, there were two instances, like her brother Sam said one night, Elvis looked at Sam and said, you know, I still love your sister. This was months after Linda was gone. I still love your sister. I'll never stop loving your sister. And then she got, actually Aunt Delta actually told her that one night she came upstairs because she heard Elvis playing the piano. In Elvis' office, he had a piano. And he was playing um, one of the, a song, I think it was Unchained Melody. And Aunt Delta said to Elvis, are you all right, son? Are you okay? He, she's, he's like, Aunt Delta, after five years, it's not easy to get over a person. So he, he was pretty broken up about it. Even though, you know, he was doing what he was doing with the other women, he loved her. That was just how Elvis was. There was never, it, you can never question if Elvis said he loved you, he loved you. You know, he did those other things, yeah. But she said you can never question um, when he loved you because he really did. And so, now... Um, she went on, uh, she went back to, I think she moved out to, uh, Los Angeles, back to her apartment. And, um, so she would call, actually, even after all that, she would call Elvis to check on him. Still, even after they split, even after she knew there was another woman. She loved him so much that she still called him and checked on him. Are you okay? Are you eating right? Are you exercising? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. You know, you know, and then she called again. She called him like two or three times in the eight months that they were apart from each other before he passed. And, you know, the last time she talked to him, you know, she was like, oh, I got, I got a part in Hee Haw. This was like 70, you know, 77. And, you know, you got to watch it when I go on. I'll be on, I think, in September or October. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll watch it. She's like, not knowing he was not going to be here at that point. But, you know, he's like, he's like, call here anytime you want, honey. You know, I still love you. And they were talking like they never broke up, she said. And he was like, honey, this, baby, that, you know, you know, I still love you. Anything you need, I'm here for you. You know, she said that was the nicest thing is that we didn't part on bad terms. We still loved each other. We were still the best of friends. And, you know, anything I needed, he could call me. And she, you know, one phone call, he's like, you know, if you want, if you want to start your own business, I'll help you out. I'll give you $100,000. You could, And she said, Elvis, I wasn't with you, you know, so I could reap financial benefits. I was with you because I love you and that's all I ever wanted from you. And he, he stopped for a while. He's like, I, I appreciate that. But I want you to know if you ever need me, you know I'm always here for you. And that was the last time they talked. And so she got the call. She actually called again <clears throat> August the 12th, 1977, but he wasn't home. Oh, he was home, excuse me. He wasn't... Uh, awake I think so Charlie picked up the phone Charlie Hodge so Linda's like I have a bad feeling about him this was August 12th <clears throat> excuse me please go check on him Charlie I have a very bad feeling please go check on him he's like I think he's okay you know he's I think he's just sleeping she said Charlie please just go check on him so Charlie goes she said I don't know if Charlie really did 
But she said he came back. He said he's okay. He's sleeping. He's fine. Don't worry about it. So that was, you know, the next phone call she got was on August the 16th from Lisa Marie. My daddy's dead. My daddy's dead. They, he's, he's buried in the carpet. That's what Lisa said. Those are the exact words she said to Linda. He's buried in the carpet. And she's thought, you know, no, daddy's fine. Daddy's fine. And then finally, I think she actually, um, she either dropped the phone or she threw it after believing Lisa. And she finally picked the phone and Lisa was still on the phone. And um, she said, well, who's there with you? And, and uh, you know, hang up the phone and, and you know. So finally, her, she didn't know it, but her brother Sam was there. Sam Thompson was at the house. And he picked up the phone, took it away from Lisa, and he said, Linda, you need to get here now. And she's like, please, I know you're my brother, but please tell me. He said, Linda, you just have to get here. She's like, Sam, is he, did he really die? And she said, he paused for a minute, took a deep breath and said, Linda, we lost him. You have to come home. Come home now. And so she did. And so she went for the funeral and everything. This to me was, I'm not taking anything away from Priscilla. I'm not taking anything away from anybody it was ever with. This was the most heartbreaking story I had to do about anybody that was with Elvis and knew Elvis. And, you know, it broke my heart because as much as I read this, as much as I didn't want to face the realities of just how bad Elvis's addictions were, you know, we all know. But when you hear it, from somebody that was there in detail. It's hard to listen to. It was hard for me to listen to. It's hard for me to tell you guys about it. You know, there's many stories how, what exactly it was that um, caused Elvis to uh, pass away, but, uh, you could shake a tree as much you, as you want, but the same leaves are still going to fall out of it. In other words, will we ever know the truth? Did the drugs cause it? Was it, uh, because Elvis's family had that history of heart problems, and I believe Elvis had somewhat of a heart problem you know who's to say if exactly it was the drugs or his heart or this or that my take on it was you know it was just his time to leave you know and um linda always said she did not want to be there. She did not want to be there when that happened. She knew it was coming. She did not want to be there when that happened. She said she feels horrible for Ginger. She has nothing bad to say about Ginger. She had nothing bad to say about any women Elvis was with. She said we all loved him. She was willing to put, a, put her own hurt aside to say, you know, we all love Elvis, all, all, all us women, you know, and she just, she felt very bad for what Ginger had to go through to find him that day. 
um, that it's not anything anybody should ever have to go through. And uh, I, I feel bad for Ginger too. You know, whether you liked her or not, that's still an awful thing to have to go through. And uh, so she said Elvis's, naturally Elvis's funeral was beautiful and um, as beautiful as it can be, can be expected. And um, she wore, the day of his funeral, she wore a purple dress. Not to, at that time it was black, people traditionally wore black. Not so much these days, but she wore purple because that was Elvis's, uh, he thought purple was like a, a eternal color in this, like spiritually. So it meant something uh, to him that color purple in that way. And so that's why she wore, I think I'm going to have a picture at the end of this video, a purple dress. That's why she wore it that day. It was for that reason. But I think Linda was an amazing woman. I think she stood with Elvis through a lot of things. <clears throat> I'm not saying, you know, everything was always bad between them. It wasn't. They had a lot of fun. They did have a lot of fun times. They went on vacations and this and that. You know, it wasn't always the bad things, you know. But the things that were there are the things that broke them up. You know, and they got worse and worse. And that's why you can't blame her for wanting to have that normal life and be with somebody that's going to be faithful to her and be there when she needs him to be there, you know. You couldn't blame her for wanting those things, you know. Those are normal things in life. And that's, you know, she did what she had to do. And it's just nice that they, um, it's nice that they never lost that love for each other. They remained friends still there for each other and what was nice too was vernon after the funeral and everything uh, uh linda was in memphis and vernon went to see linda and she, he talked to her to thank her and this is the truth he said if it wasn't for you i would have lost my son years ago if it wasn't for you and you know what after these stories i just told you guys that's the truth that's the truth of it and so uh now linda i know this is a long video guys i'm so sorry um linda did some acting for a while she uh in 1977, she was a regular on Hee Haw. I think she did that for, I don't know how long, maybe 15 years, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly how long. And then she had small roles. She played in Chips. You guys remember that? Starsky and Hutch, uh, uh, Show Vegas, Fantasy Island, The Fall Guy. Even Beverly Hills 90210, she was on there. Um, and she was also and she did a couple of TV pilots. Uh, Mars Base One, Two for Two. Uh, she appeared in a couple of movies called Three on a Meat Hook, Rabbit Test, Original Intent. And she also had a small role in The Bodyguard. <laughs> now, which brings me to her songwriting abilities. Now, people didn't know this, but Linda was um, a great poet and she wrote beautiful which led her to writing uh, music lyrics she actually had presently is a lyricist and um, she's written and co-written many songs you guys might have heard of and she's won awards or been nominated for them and so she actually began her career as a lyricist through Kenny Rogers because he, she gave, she met Kenny Rogers' wife on Hee Haw. And one night she presented one of the poems she was working on. And Kenny 
uh, took it and he read it and he said he wanted to record it. He, he said, you should be, you should be a lyricist. And so that's when her songwriting started, career started right then. And also uh, Elvis's former piano player, David Briggs really helped her out too. He also inspired her. And then uh, the song, she began her career as a lyricist with Kenny Rogers' single, Our Perfect Song, from his album, The Heart of the Matter in 85. Um, she also collaborated with composer Richard Marks on Josh Groban's first hit record, To Where You Are, with composer Steve Dorff and Celine Dion hit, Miracle, and Andreas Carlson with Drowning by the Backstreet Boys, and composer David Foster on several other compositions, including No Explanation for the film Pretty Woman. Uh, and she also, Linda wrote the song, I Have Nothing, that Whitney Houston sang in the movie The Bodyguard. Now, how ironic is that? I never even knew Linda Thompson wrote that song, number one. Number two, most of you guys know Whitney Houston's mom, Sissy, sang back up for Elvis. So how funny is that? So yeah, that song, um, I Have Nothing If I Don't Have You, Linda Thompson wrote that song. She was a beautiful, she still is, she still writes songs for people. She was an amazing poet and Elvis uh, wanted her to be, told her she should, you know, put her poems to music. And uh, she finally did. And... Uh, I think that was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Song in 93. And for the grant and for a Grammy Award for Best so Song Written specifically for a motion picture in 1994. Oh, that was Grown Up Christmas List. If you guys ever heard that song, Grown Up Christmas List in 1994, Linda Thompson wrote that. That was hers. In 99, Linda Thompson, Clint Eastwood, Carol Bayer Sega wrote Why Should I Care for the film True Crime in 2001. She wrote Drowning for the American Boy Band, The Backstreet Boys. In 2011, Linda Thompson, David Foster, Jackie Ivanko collaborated on the title track for Ivanko's film Dream With Me. Thompson and David Foster received the 2003 Emmy Award for Outstanding Music and Lyrics for Aren't They All Our Children for the Concert for World Children's Day, which aired on November 14, 2002. Uh, she was, so she, was, she had a lot of talents, Linda Thompson, besides being beautiful on the inside and outside. She's got the amazing... Uh, poet abilities and and she went on to have uh she said now it's a 30 year and counting songwriting career and as you can tell she's written quite a few of them i never knew she wrote that one song for whitney houston for the movie bodyguard that's amazing to me and it's a beautiful song it really is and uh so in 1980 uh linda started dating um, Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner and then they got married in 81 and then they had two sons Linda has two sons Brandon and Brody and then they uh, separated in 86 after Bruce revealed he wanted to be you know a woman and then uh, Linda remarried in 1991 to David Foster and then they divorced in 2005 uh, Linda also got some honors and awards. Um, Linda won a BMI Film and TV Award in 1994 for Most Performed Song from a Film, I Have Nothing, composed by Thompson and David Foster for the soundtrack, The Bodyguard. She shared special recognition awards in 1997 and 2004 with several others for work related to the Olympics, including lyrics for the official 1996 Olympic theme song, 
The Power of the Dream, sung by Celine Dion. Yeah, so Linda helped write that one too. She was a, she's, oh my God. She's amazing. She's an amazing lyricist now. You know, she does a lot of work for a lot of artists. She really does. So I have, um, I have two small, well, one's a bigger video. And then there's a smaller video, Linda just giving her, uh, she talks about Elvis a little bit, but I actually have a special treat for you guys for hanging in so long. <laughs> um, there was, uh, it's not very popular, but one night, uh, see, Elvis bought Linda's brother, Sam Thompson, a house around the corner from Graceland. And El Elvis and Linda would go there sometimes at night. So one night, Sam had this recorder. They were all just hanging out, you know, BSing and hanging around and laughing. And so uh, Linda's brother, Sam, looked at Elvis like, can, you know, insinuating, can I hit the record button? Elvis like winked his head, yeah, like, you know, go ahead. So this is a recording of Elvis, Linda, Sam. I think Ricky Stanley was there too. Uh, Linda's parents were also there at Sam's house. They're all just hanging around. And you can hear them all joking and laughing. And I thought it was a really cool thing just for you guys just to hear Elvis in his element. You know, just hanging out with the woman he loves, hanging out with his friends and family. You know, it's one of those rare things that you that you can find out there that, that's really, really cool. So that's why I wanted to attach it to this video. So you could just hear just, you know, Elvis just being Elvis the guy. You know what I mean? Just hanging around having fun, you know? So I thought that was really cool. And this will that'll be on right after we're done here. <laughs> okay. So that excuse me, that'll be on and then the small video of Linda talking will be on also. All right, guys. I know this was such a long one. I am, you know, I apologize, but I hope you guys through this video get a better sense of who Linda Thompson was, both, uh, you know, as a person and as a talent, really. I mean, I just personally, in my opinion is, you know, everybody's got their favorites who Elvis was with. And, I, and I'm not going to play favorites, but I'll tell you this much. Uh, I think Linda was, still is, one amazing person. And I think, on a personal note, you know, I don't want to get into uh, that movie or anything, but it's a shame that she was left out of it. That's all I have to say about that. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you learned something about uh miss linda thompson the beautiful miss linda thompson and i say beautiful because i mean inside too what a beautiful person what a caring person what a loving person amazing lady all around so all right guys i'm gonna stop now and like i said i hope you enjoyed this video of Elvis and Linda and Sam at Sam's house just hanging out. I think it's really cool and I think you guys will dig it too. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. You know, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you haven't, please do. And if you like the video, guys, please do me a favor. Hit that like button. I really do appreciate it because it does help me out. So, I hope you guys are all doing well. And as always... TCB and God bless. <laughs> Boy, those things are cut into you. We don't play very much, do you? No, hold on. Not the cows. You ever see Burton's? This cow is. Actual lead. Actual lead. Burton is the guy that's the bass player. Lead. Lead.
uh, Emory Gordon thing. But it's saying run to die mate so we'll cut that part <laughs> did, did you hear a little poem that I wrote called as I awoke this morning when all sweet things are born a robin perched on, on my windowsill to greet the coming dawn he sang his song so sweetly and paused for a moment's lull I gently raised the window and crushed his fucking skull. <laughs> oh, Lord. Birdie, birdie, in the snow. Broken <laughs> wing could not go. You hear that? That was a bad one. <laughs> you say I'm getting into this? You know, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you first told me that I was going to have you, that's so pretty. I knew there was something bird. coming. I knew <laughs> Gently <laughs> 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 Over there by Rick, Rick, let's go. Rick, you'll let you laugh. Come on, just go. I think he does well.
She teach you that song? Oh, look, all of them. All of them, man. I know well, Sam's got some new ones. Shut up, yo. Say, Ma. Drink beer. Sing the what was yours? Ring a Marie. Ring a Marie. Sing the fast one. Ring a Marie. I don't remember. Ring a Marie. Ring a Marie. Ring a Marie. Actually, things like that. That's almost better than, was it? Do Ride a Do, was it? Ride a Do Die. Ride a Do Die. Yeah, we have to sing that in front of a lot of strange people. Linda gets me to do it. Ride a Do Die. I looked over there and he's just sitting there going, Ride a Do Die. Ride a Do Die. <laughs> As I awoke this morning. <laughs> oh, I love it. All sweet things are born. I think it's going to be such a pretty little poem. Oh, yeah. My daddy told mom, he said, man, she was in this kick of writing songs, and daddy said, well, I got a good one for you. Now he wants back in, Ricky. Hello, Hello baby. Just a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Well, not that. You gotta pull the screen on. Get me down. Dusty. Me. Pardon me. I don't know. What time is it? It's supper time, right? 7.20. Get hungry. Get that lean and hungry. Get that lean and hungry. He told me that with her. She said, how long will it take you, Rick, to get from the hospital to the house and back? Linda goes, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I got that yeah. lean and hungry look. I said, okay. Lean and hungry. What's it? Lottie, who's the other one that works? Ma uh, Pauline. Nancy, Mary, and Pauline. Pauline. They did all the cooking for a while in the hospital. They, they did? Yeah. They brought it up there? Well, sure. Is yeah. they, they cook it at home and Ricky's bringing it up there every night. I don't believe you. I wouldn't eat a hospital food either. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> they, they, gave me, they gave us what, you know. He could order meat just bowl, whatever we wanted to have. Yeah, but that home cooking just really broke the uh, monotony. Oh, you know? I'm sure. Right. That food at the hospital, it's, it's not seasoned. Mm -hmm. No, it's kind of bland. Were well, they really seasoned the food? Huh? Do they know what you want to eat? I haven't called them. Tell them. They've already got oh, fixed, but you better call them and tell them we're in the process of moving. Yeah. We come over here and do any karate demonstrations and mm -hmm. get cut yeah, out. <laughs> Did you have any special difficulty in, in dating Elvis? Uh, how did it affect you? Not really, you? no. I, maybe because of my youth or whatever. I'm a very adaptable person, and it just sort of seemed very right and very natural. When you love someone, they suddenly, you know, it wasn't Elvis on the marquee anymore. It was Elvis with a little E. You mm -hmm. know, it was just a human soul that I happened to love. What were dates with Elvis like? Dates with Elvis consisted of riding golf carts around Graceland or riding motorcycles or three-wheelers or going to movies uh, that he had rented out. He would rent an entire theater out and show movies all night. And uh, he enjoyed going roller skating occasionally. He would uh, rent the fairgrounds out and ride the roller coaster 15 times in a row, that sort of thing. But he would never, ever go anywhere in disguise or try to go... No, no, yeah. incognito. Yeah. Because he had his own walk, he had his own stance, you know, there was no way that he could really disguise who he was. Not effectively. We tried going out a few times shopping, and we would make it halfway between the car and the door of the store. And, you know, people would just be all over us. They would converge immediately, and we would have to run back to the car. So it was very difficult for him to get out like a normal person. When do you think Elvis felt the, the need to be so generous? It almost got to be second nature with him, you know, it was just um, a facet of his character, you know, like um, drinking a lot of water or whatever, you know, he just, that was just part of his, his nature. And it was, it was really astounding if you just sat back and pondered for a few moments about the extent of his generosity. It was incredible. And it began, he told me the story, and I think it's really a sweet little story, when he was nine years old. He said that he got saved in the Christian sense. And he, all he had, they were very, very poor in Tupelo, Mississippi, Elvis's family. He said he was dirt poor. And he suddenly was just filled with this wonderful spirit. And all he had in the world were comic books. So he took all of his comic books and he ran out into the street and he started giving his comic books away to all his little neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a, what a really sweet story, that, because that generosity never stopped. You know, that, that spirit of giving stayed with him throughout his life. What kinds of things bothered him? What kind of things did he like to talk to you about? I think probably the thing that bothered him most was that he was an intensely lonely person at heart. He felt that, you know, he was so alone in his fame mm -hmm. and in his, uh, in his thoughts, as we all are. I often said to him, gosh, you know, you, you possess so much love. So many people love you in so many different ways. 
And he said, but you don't understand, it's not a personal love. They don't know me. They don't know what goes inside, what goes on inside me, you know, what my thoughts are, what my feelings are, what my background is. You know, they know what they've read and they love me and I appreciate that love, but they don't love me in a personal way. So it was important to him to have people around that he felt did love him in a personal way. What was driving Elvis? Was he always trying to be the king? He never tried. It just happened. He had no idea that he was as sexy as he was on stage. He was brought up in a Pentecostal church. Um, emotions are bare and raw, you know, in the South even, but particularly in the Pentecostal religion. Um, they're not, a, not afraid to display their emotional content, mm -hmm. and, and they certainly do during services. And he was brought up in that sort of atmosphere. So he was used to moving when he was singing. And that was just a very natural thing for him to do, and he had no idea that it, it uh, turned a lot of people on and turned well, a lot of people off. What got to him at the end? Was it his uh, frustrations or, or, or what? I think, yes, he was frustrated in the sense that he had done everything um, that he could do at that point in his career, and he wanted to progress. He wanted to go on. He wanted to tour Europe. He wanted to make a very legitimate, decent film that would provide him with the proper vehicle to display his acting ability. He could have been a terrific actor, and he was frustrated in that respect, I think. In show business and in the recording industry, many people move out to the West Coast, out to Los Angeles, but Elvis never did that. He always kept his roots here and kept his home in Memphis. Why do you think he did that? I think it makes a very positive statement about Elvis's character that he did choose to maintain his home in Memphis because those were his roots. That's where his family was. And the South has its own sort of culture, its own lifestyle, and a slower, easier pace, and the people here are more salt-of-the-earth people, you know, more normal people. Mm -hmm. And I think that he tried to maintain some sort of semblance of normality in his life, and that was his way, one of the ways that, in which he tried to do that. So I think that does make a very positive statement about him, that he didn't get caught up in the Hollywood life. And he